adding some layers to Elmo. Um, and I'm always pushing for that. I'm always pushing for, does Elmo really love this? Can he not like it? And if he loves it, that's the end of the story. Now, if I look at a script and I say, okay, well, does he really love umbrellas? Right. <laughs> you know, can, can he be indifferent about umbrellas? Yeah. Um, it, it's a very rich character if you, if you look at it. Uh, you can choose to look at it as what a lot of people see, but I like to think he's 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 pretty layered if you're if you're willing to look for it. Welcome back to Puppeteers. We're your hosts, Adam Krutinger and Cameron Garrity, and today we have Ryan Dillon on the show. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Hi, guys. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, Ryan, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, is a uh, Muppet performer on Sesame Street, best known for doing uh, Elmo since 2013. Um, he, he's been with the show since he was about uh, 16 or 17 years old. And uh, he's also the founder with Mark Gale of the Dylan Gale Idiots. Uh, you could check them out on YouTube and Instagram and they got some great stuff. And we're just so happy to have him here. So Ryan, you got Dillon, the plugs out of the way. I can get out of here. Yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ryan, welcome to Puppeteers. We're we're so glad to have you. No, thanks for having me, guys. I, uh, you know, I I'm so glad that you guys are doing this. I think I talked to you about that, Cameron. I think it's just really important. There's so little information out there with this group of performers and puppeteers and and uh, just hearing their stories and learning from them. I think I, I'm just glad that this is being recorded and we're hearing from lots of different people. So I, I just thank you guys for doing this. Oh my gosh, our absolutely. pleasure. Yeah, yeah and I, I think it's important to, you know, we as puppeteers, Years, though we're not at the status that you know some of our guests are but um to be able to have a perspective and ask some maybe more um in, uh, uh, detailed questions or more specific questions than you might get if you were talking to someone yeah. on uh, on the, the day show or something. right yeah. right or, and also too like like uh, when i first was pitching it to camera i was like you know i was like i want to talk to some of, some of my friends i want to talk to jim Krupp. i want to talk to john yeah. little and you know what other people might enjoy listening in on those conversations. So absolutely. And yeah, yeah I mean, everybody has their own avenue and, and their own technique. And I think, you know, those two people that you mentioned are, are they do the same thing in completely different ways. So I just, I'm glad that that kind of thing is being showcased. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. enough about John Little. Let's get to <laughs> brass tags. <laughs> All right. So what, uh, what are you working on now? Anything new? Yeah. So a lot's going on right now. Um, on the Sesame Street end of things, we are um, right smack in the middle of the 50th anniversary doing um, anniversary celebrations and promotions for that. That's going to be going throughout the year. So you're going to be seeing a lot of Sesame Street stuff this year for um, for kids and fans and families and you know, we're, 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 there's a, there's some potentially exciting stuff coming in the summer that isn't official yet, but it might mean some seeing some more of those characters in a bigger way. Um, let's see. Um, I just worked on a little thing with the Muppets that might be coming out soon. And on the, on the Dylan Gale idiot side, um, we are very deep into production for things where, um, we also have a bigger project that we're in the works and, and we're trying to get out there so more people can see it. Um, so stay tuned on that. We're, we don't have anything um, that we can officially announce yet, but we're we're very busy working behind the scenes um, to get a bigger um, audience out there. And um, you know, we've been doing lots of stuff on social media, so it's been uh, it's been a very busy busy year or so, but it's 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 been great. That's very yeah, cool. That's right. Yeah. Now, um, obviously, you know, I think anyone who listens to the show has heard of Sesame Street. Um, but for people who aren't familiar with the the Dylan Gale Idiots, can you describe kind of what what that zaniness is? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, so Mark and I, uh, Mark Gale, who's a performer who uh, has had a history with uh, Henson Company and 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 just the puppetry universe for quite some time now. Uh, he and I met several years ago at this point, uh, I think maybe 2005 or 2006, something like that. And he had already been working on things on his own and I had been working on things on my own and we had realized that we sort of worked really well together. And since then I've been sort of collaborating on personal projects that has sort of culminated in a, in a group of characters that we do. And, um, you know, it's it's a difficult thing to describe. It's it's very much just sort of the characters that are, you know, it's 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 us portraying different kinds of characters that are facets of ourselves. And um, we've been doing lots of social media stuff. You can see a lot of our stuff on Instagram and, um, and it's been really fun. It's a nice sort of, um, it's a nice sort of deviation from 
the way we're typically used to seeing that style of puppetry. And we're always trying to sort of push ways to to um, bend the rules or, or, you know, now that we've learned the rules, how do how can we smudge them around and how can we um, so yeah, there's uh, it's it's hard to describe, but if you check it out, I think hopefully yeah. you'll you'll enjoy it. Yeah, I watch a bunch of stuff. It's it's really compelling. What uh, to, just for so people can get a better idea too. Like, who would you say is your like target audience for that? Would you say? Yeah, we never really put a target audience on it deliberately. Um, I think it definitely skews to adults, but um, we certainly don't aim for adults. We're not necessarily, you know, the dirty puppet show. It's never really been our aim. Um, but I've always been interested in characters um, that appeal to everybody. You know, I think it's probably not a children's show, but um, it's equally interesting to kids. It's funny, Frankie Cordero, who's uh, who's a very dear friend of mine and a puppeteer at Sesame and works with Dylan Gale. He, uh, he just had a baby about six months ago and he's been testing things on the baby. So it works for old people. It works for... 18 to 35 and it works for babies. Perfect. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good demo to have. It's a very wide demo to have. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what I love about watching that is, and you, you kind of alluded to this, that it it's kind of different than Sesame or even the, the Muppet work. It's, it just has this like weird level of like, it's almost, Dr. Seussian in mm. a way because it's just it's it has a the the puppets themselves have a, a really great aesthetic and I I think you'd even you guys are able to manage a different kind of manipulation um just in the the mouth work um mm. the oh interesting of those guys that I, I I don't think you see in the the Muppets um I mean maybe uh uh uh, Uncle Deadly, but um, mm. it's just it's uh, amazing the just the manipulation that you guys achieve with that. Oh, thanks, I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, yeah we, um, you know, I've always been a performer who um, was very big on subtlety and minutia in my performance and and um, and nuance. You know, uh, I somebody who I studied a lot when I was a kid was, um, you know, obviously Frank, but you know Karen Prell and people like that. People who would really um, work on the vowel sounds of the puppet. And uh, that was something that always interested me. I was I was into animation too as a kid. Um, when I, I always either wanted to be, I told people I'd wanted to work for the Muppets or work for Disney as an animator, which are like you know lofty goals. But uh, I I didn't have the patience for animation. But what I loved about it is you know you'd look in these animation books and they would give you okay here's how you draw an ooh or an ah or here an, an a and and. That always intrigued me, those charts. And so I, I am probably somebody who does a bit of that. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of, we, we've deliberately deviated from the Muppet style in the sense that they are, they are television puppets, but um, what we get really excited about is using them in ways that we, that would surprise people. Um, that don't that don't make a joke of the fact that they're just puppets in a human world, but that there are these living things that have their own rules. Um, and we use a lot of editing to sort of, Com we combine a lot of editing tricks with the puppetry. And right. um, so it very much is a video performance. They would be a very different thing live. Um, totally. So yeah, it's a, it's a fun experiment. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the editing really does kind of become its own character, you know, just the way you're able to, to cut between different things. And, right. Uh, I think Mark kind of pops up every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, as himself. himself, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we discovered the joy of, we have this new character. We've been doing this sort of uh, ongoing series on Instagram called good morning to you with one of my characters, Kip. And he is this uh, exuberant sort of man boy. And uh, he has this little show in his living room that he does. And uh, we yeah, were going right to over your left shoulder for people watching. Oh, there he yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, there he is the orange one. And, um, and so we, we love the idea of maybe incorporating the other characters and there just happened to be one day where I said, okay, Mark, I need you to do Mark lives in Texas. So, Whenever we, we try and go, I go there, he comes here for weeks at a time and we'll do, we'll bank shoot a bunch of stuff. But when we can't do that, I will have to call him and say, okay, I need Frank to talk about this. Talk, have him talk about the art of the deal. Go. And he will, you know, and then he'll just start talking and send me videos. Well, it was going to be one of those things. And I was right up against the deadline. I had to put a video out and I said, I need Frank to talk about, I don't know what it was. And then we just talked about it and said, well, why don't you just go in the car and talk about it? Why don't you just do it? And so he became the man of the car because we always, you know, I, I love Mark's facial expressions and and just sort of his his blank stares can do more than Frank could sometimes. But uh, so, yeah, we, we have fun with that, too, sort of having human characters and, and puppets. And, you know, it's 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 a good time. 
Yeah, yeah. he's he's funny. Yeah, he'd be a great dad doing commentary for just like like fail videos or something, and just like pre pre record. <laughs> that would be hysterical. <laughs> yes, character. Yeah, he's uh, Mark is an incredible performer. He um, he's got uh, what I always I think the reason we were attracted to each other as uh, performing partners was that we both had very strong. Uh, he more so than I in the beginning had very strong feelings about the characters that we were playing. And, and he was kind of doing his own thing. You know, you couldn't hear somebody else in his characters. And I, that was very exciting to me. I think what tends to happen with a lot of newer performers is you hear a lot of people who kind of sound like Jim or kind of sound like Frank. And, and what I liked about Mark was it was like a punch in the face. I'd never heard somebody that did characters like that. And, um, and he was, and so he he brings a very unique sense to the work, and and um, and his sensibilities uh, were very unique and exciting to me. And so, yeah, we we have a lot of fun. It's very silly and, and very fun. So, do you build these characters too? Yeah, so I've been a builder for um, a long time. I started building relatively young. I started building when I was about eleven or twelve. And, you know, your first five years, you're you're not making anything good, but, um, you know, I, I, and, and when I first moved to the city, I was doing lots of commission work and stuff like that. And, and it, it sort of fell by the wayside. That whole world is changing anyway. Um, but, uh, so yeah, I've, I've, I've built a lot of puppets in my time and, and, you know, dabbled. I, I, in the past I had, you know, worked in some shops here and there and dabbled in working on some other puppets for other shows. And, I've had the luxury of um, learning a lot from really gifted builders, yeah. um, and I enjoy building. Um, I enjoy, I enjoy, uh, I enjoy it sometimes. You know, when you're sitting there gluing at four in the morning, it's not so fun. But uh, I love the. I've always loved the idea of taking a flat image and translating it into three dimensions. I, I love s sculpture of any kind. I love soft sculpture. I was always interested in toy design. You know, really good toy design. I was always fascinated at, at how somebody could could take a flat image or a cartoon and, and really translate it and make, and, and you believe it's a, it's a, it's a living thing. Um, and that's, I think I, I never, it's funny. I didn't really want to build puppets when I was a kid. I had no interest in it. And um, it was just a necessity, you know, at the time, I'm sure you guys remember, there wasn't really a way to, you couldn't go to the puppet store. If you, if you did, it was, you were buying commercial puppets or you were buying sort of puppets that were used for, um, you know, ministry or things like that, which would give you lip sync and stuff, but you, it wasn't really what I was looking for. Um, and so it was sort of out of necessity that I had to build my own puppets. Um, and it was harder then. I mean, the, the, the materials you had access to, it's so great now because you, you can pretty much find anything you need. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I remember, I remember hot gluing some really bad fur together for a really long time, going to Joanne's and finding like, a real dark brown fur that's, you know, it's going to read on camera as black, but I don't care. It's fur and I'd buy three yards of it and, you know, hot glue it up. And, but, uh, but yeah, I've, uh, I've luckily gotten better since then. <laughs> I actually um, used one of your puppets uh, when I was uh, an emerging artist at the O'Neill. Oh, you did? Ago. Yeah, because uh, you, you, I think you donated a, a couple years back some like uh, anything Muppet type thing. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, some blank, blank characters, and um, I ended up actually using uh, one of them without any features on it because it was a whole thing about like medical world and stuff mm. and uh, it was just a wonderful uh, design and I you know not used it as for what it was intended for because uh, hey but that's great I, yeah, I'm glad they're getting cool. used Absolutely. you know I, I, that's that's uh, as I'm sure you guys know you do you, you guys both build so Adam is definitely like the builder. Um, I I did of about us. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't. Of, of us of us yeah, yeah. between I, us. I did about the like the first three years of building out of necessity and uh -huh. not building anything that good. Um, and then I met him before I kind of broke <laughs> through that time. So I Adam builds the puppets and I build the uh, the spreadsheets. Um, I do all <laughs> yes. of our producing and stuff. Oh, very cool. And stuff. So that's, yeah, that's I, uh, dynamic works. Well, Adam, I'm sure you know, you know, you end up collecting a bunch of prototypes and, 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 and heads and things you can't use. And slowly that box was building and building and building. And I said, Pam, I don't know what to do with these things. She said, bring them to the O'Neill. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad they're getting some use at the O'Neill. Absolutely. Yeah. My shop is definitely like that as well. I've got body parts all over the yep. place, scraps of piles of fur at the, at, at the tips of our toes right now. 
Yeah, well, tell me about it. This place is a mess. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's it's endless. <laughs> it's endless. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'd love to get talking a little bit about where where you got started. You mentioned, you know, being, you know, on on the younger side when you were interested in puppetry. Yeah. But, uh, what was there a time for you before puppetry? What? what were no. Um, you know, I was really lucky. I'm sure you guys know this. Um, for puppeteers, it's it's one of two things typically, you know, it's it's the it's the only thing you know, or you find it later in life after you've tried a couple other things. For me, it, it very much was the only thing I knew for a long. I the first thing I've I, the first memory I have of television was the Muppet Show, the Muppet Show opening theme. I actually remember being in my crib and holding the bars. And I wanted to get out of the crib and get into the TV because I, I saw the kick line of all the girls singing the theme song. And I just it was I had never seen anything like that before. Um, and so I, I it, it was something that was kind of always there. You know, I, I the Muppet Show was the running sound in my house when I was a kid. Um, and uh, I always loved that. I, I mean, I always loved animation as well. As I said, I was a big fan of like, you know, the Disney films and things like that. But puppetry, I really loved because it was a direct performance. It was something I could do immediately. Animation, you had to really time out and draw. And, and I loved puppetry because it was it was immediate and it was direct. It was a direct connection to your body in a performance. And I thought that was really exciting. And um, I don't think I knew for a long time that I wanted to be a puppeteer. But I would always tell people I wanted to work with the Muppets. And I didn't really know what that meant. Yeah, I didn't know if that meant I would make puppets or if I would build puppets, but all I knew, or, or perform puppets, but all I knew is, you know, I, I I would stare at those books. You know, I would stare real close at those Muppet books and look for seams and, and look on the pictures, you know, where they're on set and look for the monitors. And who's that guy? What's a stage manager? You know, I, th that kind of stuff was so fascinating to me. Um, and so I started experimenting and my sister and I, when we were very young, would put on puppet shows for family and stuff like that with our hand puppets. And I had a Muppet album that we would do. We would do the whole album. It was like an hour long. We'd make our family sit through an hour of this abysmal two children behind a piano bench, just doing this for two hours or something. Uh, and it was a really, I was kind of always um, like the ham in the family. I was always the one who was, doing voices or mimicking people. And, but somehow I didn't really like that attention being on me. I was definitely of that puppeteer. I, I was of that feeling of, I felt more comfortable here. Um, so, you know, I made puppets here and there, but I never really took it seriously until I was about, I guess, I guess I was about 11 or 12 when I started thinking, this is something I should really focus on. Cause I could, I, I started to get the lip sync down and I felt like it was something I could do. Um, and the first tape I sent, I think I was 13 or 14. I was a kid. And um, to their credit, Henson sent a letter back and said, you know, you're really good, but we can't hire you. So here's what we would, ex we, he, here's what we think you should do. And, you know, they said, get a monitor and all those things. So um, I didn't, we didn't grow up with a lot of money. So I never had a camera, television camera. Uh, we just couldn't afford it. And um, I didn't really get one until... I guess high school time, I, I borrowed a friend's camera and uh, I was hooked. I mean, once I was able to connect that camera to my television and create my own performances, that was, I mean, that was it. I knew that was it. Um, so I sent another tape when I was about 16 or so. And I remember Kevin Clash called and I wasn't home, but I think my dad was home. And he said, oh, yeah, Kevin Clash called today. And I was like, what? <laughs> uh, and he had just said, you know, he's young, but have him keep sending tapes. And, you know, one day we'll be able to use him, maybe. And so that was all I needed. I just thought, that's it. OK, now this is it. Um, and in my, I guess it was my junior year of high school, there was a big open call for puppeteers. Uh, for the Muppets in Disney, in, uh, excuse me, for Disney and Sesame. Um, and it was in New York, and I believe they held one in LA, and I believe they held one in Toronto. And uh, 
really, I just wanted to get in the door and be seen. You know, I just felt like, the, you know, the Muppets never audition. And I knew that historically, they're not looking at people. Who leaves the Muppets? So I was 17 at the time or 16. I may have been 17. And I called them. I just cold called Henson. And I think maybe Joey Roddy picked up the phone. And I said, uh, you know, I really would like to do this, but I'm 17. Is there any way that you could give me, uh, you know, give give me an allowance to sort of go? And and they said, yeah, OK, sure, you can come. And I think they felt like, let's just he's just going to keep calling. So let's just say yes. <laughs> we'll kick him out. It'll be fine. Remember the kid. Throw yeah. him a bone. <laughs> Throw him a bone. And so I went and it was at Ripley Greer Studios. I'll never forget it. It was the weirdest day of my life because I, I walked in and I had, I had known a couple of puppet, pe puppet people at that point. You know, I had sort of made some connections and I hadn't worked on anything, but I knew some people in the puppet world. And um, so I saw some friends of mine and, and met some people that I'd, you know, kind of casually known. And it was, it was a room of God, maybe 200 people or so. And it was a it was definitely a cattle call. I mean, they would throw ten people in there, they'd put the eyes on you, you'd have to lip sync in the mirror, and then they'd cut, 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 cut. And then whoever was left in the room, they put you on monitor. Well, my entire group of ten was cut, except for me. We all had to go in front of a mirror and uh, lip sync, I don't remember what it was, but with ping pong balls and, and Jane I remember Jane Henson was there, Kevin and Martin Baker and uh Oh, I can't remember. It's all a blur. Really important people were at the table. And I thought, okay, this is it. I gotta, I gotta do it. And so everybody in my row and everybody in my sort of uh, section got cut and had to leave the room. And I was just left standing there by myself. And uh, they wheel in this television, you know, on, a, on one of those, like, you know, those things in school, like the, the, the television stands. So, like, yeah. so they bring that out and I'm like, Oh God, here we go. And they set up the camera. And I had to lip sync, and it was uh, it was um, Sammy Davis Jr.'s Candyman. And now every time I hear that, I I get a little bit <laughs> because I just have memories of it. And I sat there and I did it. And um, and Kevin said to me, he's like, "Okay, thanks a lot." And Jane asked me some questions, and I remember she asked, "Why haven't we seen you before?" And I was like, "Well, I'm 17. I don't I don't know I, why." I don't. And so Kevin said, "Okay, well." stay because I want to talk to you, but you know, stay until everything's done. And I thought, what does that mean? So it was only about noon and these things were going to go to about five. So I just sort of sat and waited and waited. And it was, it was really rough because I saw really good people going, you know, and, and I just thought, what is going on here? And um, at the end of the day, Kevin was about to leave. It was about five o'clock. I had waited about five hours. Kevin was a was about to leave and I said oh excuse me you know you told me I don't know if you remember me you told me to wait and uh, he goes oh yeah um you're gonna come do sesame next month and you'll do the parade and someone will be in contact with you and he just left and I remember walking down the stairs and it was the only it was the the only real out of body experience I ever had it was it was a transcendent thing that I just couldn't it, what he had said and what I was hearing weren't linking up somehow i thought that <laughs> i've misheard something that can't be right that can't be right um and then it it was sinking in slowly and then about a i guess about a week later i got the call again from henson saying okay well we're gonna use you and uh the parade was the first thing i did i did ernie in the parade and that was amazing the parade is still one of my favorite jobs to do it's just it's just an amazing experience and then I did about two or three weeks on that season. So whatever season two, we were shooting it in 2005, it aired in 2006. And I was being handed pretty big things pretty early on. I was being given AMs with lines. And I remember I was doing a scene with uh, Carol Spinney. It was just me and Carol Spinney. And I was doing this AM with him and with Oscar. And I was just like, what the heck? hell is going on i was 17 so i had no sense of i'd never worked a job before so i had no sense of you know <laughs> social etiquette in the studio i had no i i didn't know anything i didn't know how to write hand you can't teach yourself how to write hand right. I mean, those first few weeks were rough but um people were very patient with me and and uh looking back i can really appreciate how patient people were um and so then, you know, for a while, I was doing stuff on and off with Sesame and Henson for uh, a number of years. Um, and then 
so I guess Elmo was 2013. I always have, I can never remember if it was 2012 or 2013, but 2013 sounds right. Um, and I had, you know, I'd, I'd kind of been with Sesame for quite some time at that point. They had known me, I'd been around and I was a reliable background. You know, I was somebody who was considered Ryan can do right hands. Ryan can do background. He can, he can put on your puppet and lip sync to it in the back. We know he can do that. But taking that on, I think a lot of people were surprised, myself included. Um, but uh, it's it's been a real ride, and it's it's been incredible. You know, it's one of those things you look back and you think it it, it feels really it feels like it's been a long time, but somehow it's also been a blip. It's uh, it's just it's it's been really fun. Totally. Um, now, I just uh, curious. Did you grow up in New York? Um, no, so I grew up in Philadelphia, oh, okay. um, and it was very rare that I would get out to the city. I think the first time I was in the city, I remember the first time I was in the city ever. My father drove me to the city in 2000, I want to say one or no, well, it must have been two because it wasn't It wasn't around 9-11. Maybe it was 2003 to see it was a talk back with, um, with Jerry Nelson and Jane Henson. I want to say Frank or somebody like that. And I met Jerry Nelson afterwards. And I thought, I, as soon as I got to New York, I said, this is it. This is where I want to live. And, uh, you know, it took a couple of years to get back there. But uh, And I didn't actually officially move here until, I guess it's been about 10 years or so. Prior to that, I would commute back and forth from Pennsylvania. Yeah, so it wasn't like, you know, some kids, you know, they end up growing up, like, right in New York City. And you feel yeah. like Sesame's in your backyard type thing. So, it, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, um, when you were, you know, I, 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 you described the whole thing as sort of a, a whirlwind ex experience, but as you were doing those couple of years of right-handing and reliable background and stuff, did you have any thoughts of like what long-term your career was going to be? Because I'm, I'm sure Elmo wasn't on your radar. Um, right. But d did you think of like, oh man, I'm, I'm hoping for a character one day or. Yeah. Or um, yeah. It's funny. I was just thinking about that the other day. Um, certainly you'd, I don't know that I had a plan for what it would be. I had ideas of what I'd like it to be. And hope. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. But it never ends up being the thing you think it's going to be. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think when I was performing, I, I, I had a good ear and I was able to, uh, record and catalog cadences and rhythms and sounds and stuff like that. So I was a good, I don't like the word mimic, but I was a good mimic, um, so I knew that that was something that I could probably do as a kid. I would always, you know, I, I would, I would try and learn the Muppet characters and the Disney characters and I could kind of do those. So I thought that was probably something, you know, you're always cognizant of, especially now with me within, in, in a legacy character role, you know, I'm kind of just holding the keys right now. You know, I'm, I'm the technically the fourth, but I'm the second, there will be a third, you know? And so, and that's kind of what Muppets and Sesame has been for a long time. You know, it it hasn't necessarily been new characters. Certainly there have been new characters, but um, nowadays they have so many characters to serve that in the future, it's sort of looking like you've got your main stable of characters and, and you know, how to foster and foster keeping those characters around. So I knew that was something I could do, but that wasn't really in my brain to take over a character. I think what was in my brain was, it would be great if I had an original character, but I kind of also saw the writing on the wall that that wasn't as likely as it would have been maybe 20 years prior. Sure. Um, I had a character that didn't end up going anywhere, but I had a character that Kevin was supposed to do that he uh, either didn't want to do or felt that he wanted me to do it. I'm not really sure why, but uh, we did a series of games for, I guess, I think it was Xbox or Microsoft, Xbox, something like that. It was interactive Sesame games and uh, it was a whole season of them. So you'd buy a season of game episodes and, you know, Ernie and Bert, you would help them fold laundry and you'd help Abby do something. And, you know, so um, there was, they needed a host to go through this. And it was a motion capture Muppet character called Cooper, who, who was this cute little green monster. And um, it was a shame because he was a beautiful puppet that Raleigh built. And then they decided to make him uh, a CG character, kind of like the Waldo, but... Um, it was a puppet that had, um, I don't know what you'd call them, but tracking marks all over them that they could animate to. But it was a it was a basic Muppet monster. They made two, one that you could use for promo that looked like the digital character in Muppet form. 
and one that there was just sort of a skeletal fleece structure mm -hmm. with these tracking marks on it. And so I played him. He was just, you know, a little kid monster. And that was exciting because it, that felt the closest to that thing that I wanted. You know, again, as I say, it's never what you think it's going to be. Everyone has that dream of like, I'm going to be work on Sesame Street and I'm going to have an original character. It's going to be this color and it's going to have this name and it's going to sound like this, you know, and, and certainly, you know, I had that too, but it, it was as close as I was going to get to that. And I got to do two years of that. And that was great. I mean, I had so much time with him, with that character. He was a sweet little character that I, I would have loved to have gotten on the show, but it just sort of never happened. Right. Um, and it also afforded me the ability to learn a lot about um, working in a booth because there was a lot of voiceover for it um, because it was, an, because it was an interactive game. There was tons of like, um, come on, push the button, we're waiting, you know, all that stuff. And you'd have to give every single option of what a player could do. And so that was tons of VO sessions. And that was a, that was such a gift to have. I'm so grateful I got that because, you know, working on mic technique and working in a booth and voiceover is a very different world than working um, on set with a puppet. And uh, I had done a little bit of that before. I had done some commercial campaigns and radio spots and I did like this voice match thing for Looney Tunes characters at one point. So I'd been in booths, but never in, in for long periods of time. Yeah, it's similar to the right handing. Like that's not that's right. really something you could practice at home. That's right. And, and and you know, it's funny. Now you probably could. And well, even even good. when I was starting, I probably could have. But yeah. the facilities weren't available. And, and, and you need to, of course, you then have to have the ability to know how to do that stuff. Right. So so, yes, to your point. That is something that you can't really teach yourself. And and being there, working with the engineer, working with the director, working with the client who's patching in, who has specific direction, all of that directly channeled or, or funneled into my Elmo work. You know, because half of my half of my Elmo career is in a studio, is in a is in a, a booth, yeah. doing toys or live shows or pre-recording songs or things like that. So um, as far as original characters, that was that character Cooper was was a, was a really fun thing to do. But again, as I say, it wasn't wasn't exactly as I'd planned. Did you uh, as far as the singing and stuff, did you do any theater or any singing training in your life? Very before? passively. I mean, I, I was never a theater kid because I was so shy. Um, weirdly, I was just shy about being on stage. I was never a shy person. I was very gregarious with my friends and I was sort of the class clown kind of thing. You know, I was the one doing voices and. But I theater, I always felt uncomfortable. I just never felt comfortable in my own skin to do things like that. I, I regret it. You know, I think I think it would have been a great growth thing for me. And it's something I actually tell younger performers to do, like really get an experience working as an actor before you get into a real serious puppet thing, because you're going to you're going to be playing catch up with yourself because you won't have the acting technique. But I had done certainly I had done improv. I had done um, a lot of self-study. You know, I um, I didn't go to college because I just the school structure was very challenging for me. Uh, I've I've learned in my adult life that I'm dyslexic. You know, I had no idea as a kid that that's what it was. I'm ADD. You know, it was very difficult for me to learn in that sort of a structure. And I found for myself, I was learning better with self study. And so I was constant. I was like a sponge. I was absorbing everything. Plus, I had lots of interests, right? Like I, I loved musical theater and I loved sketch comedy and and all those things. Kind of just, I was my brain was a sponge for all of that. So I didn't have um, singing training or anything like that. But I would I would do it just to yeah. just for fun. Um, and it all kind of culminated when I got to Sesame. Now, um, <laughs> obviously, uh. uh it's probably a lightning strike moment for you was taking over for Elmo. Um, how how does something like that change your life? I mean, because it's it's not the equivalent of what Kevin maybe experienced of having Richard Hunt throw you Elmo in the the, the Muppet room of this nothing yeah. character. You were th thrown it uh, in your lap, and it's the biggest character in the world. Um, how, yeah. how does that change your life? <laughs> um, that's a great question that I don't have an answer for. No, I think probably it, it's really hard to say because it, there certainly there are things that are afforded to you 
because of the work that you wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to do. Um, and I'm very aware of that. And that is something I'm very grateful for. Um, it's challenging, It's it's but it's it's such a gift to be able to do. Uh, I take it very seriously. It's it's it's. I feel I felt the responsibility certainly at the time. Uh, it was terrifying in the moment because I didn't actually think I was going to get it, um, and it wasn't like there was a big open call. You know, it definitely was something that Sesame felt very strongly about keeping in the family and making sure that it was somebody who really knew the character and the and and the and the crew. You know, that character is yeah. so important to the show that it was important that it be a family member to take over. And I was the newest of those family members of the immediate family. You know, and so um, it was it was challenging, but uh, you know. It was. It's funny because there were a few times previous to that that I had had experience with the puppet. You know, sometimes if Kevin was directing um, and he couldn't, if he was too busy working on the shot, uh, he would uh, he would say, "Here, put the puppet on, and just do it for the shot, and I'll do the voice, and you can lip sync." And that happened a number of times. It happened once on a live hit we were doing at Good Morning America or the Today Show or one of these things. I was brought in just to. I think I was just brought in to hold up Bert or something while Eric was doing another character. But usually when the Muppets take over those morning shows, there's always like the Muppets in the control room and, you know, chickens are everywhere. And, you know, and so we were doing that kind of thing and we were in a dressing room and everybody's, you know, doing, Rosita's doing Abby's hair and stuff like that. And almost just swinging in a chair. And um, he said, uh, put the puppet on. Uh, and it was a live hit. I was like, what? Why? He goes, put the, put the puppet on. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I put the puppet on. He goes, okay, I'll laugh. So just open the mouth when I laugh. I was like, you sure you don't want to do this? In five, four, three, two. And I was just doing it. Oh and God. so I, <laughs> it was terrifying. <laughs> but, you know, I was able to do it without any, but without him hating it. And so I was, I was lucky in the sense that I'd had some opportunities with that puppet previously. Maybe mm -hmm. not as much as other performers. You know, it wasn't necessarily going to be handed to me. I know that I was on a short list of people that, Kevin wanted to make sure we're seen, but it wasn't necessarily going to be the case that I, no one was looking at Ryan to do this. So uh, when I got it, it was a very weird feeling because I, I immediately felt, oh, don't screw this up, Ryan. You really have to, this is, you really take this seriously. Um, and those first, first year or two were rough because it, it is, a, it, it's, um, you know, it's something that's part of my daily life now, but in the beginning, you're the first one on set and you're the last one to leave and you're on set all day. Cause Elmo's in every show. And even if he's not the main character of every show, he's going to be in most shows. So ha just having that sort of, um, uh, stamina was, was a big learning curve, all those kind of things. It's different than when you're sort of right handing or doing backup, you can kind of go and take breaks and hang out and stuff like that. And, and, and when you're playing a main character, you really have to commit all day to that. Um, I've learned to love that. Um, and uh, what it afforded me too was was a relationship with the crew. You know, they're they're like my extended family. I, I see them all the time. When we're working, and you know, it's just so great to have that support system. But uh, yeah, I mean, it just it does take you, especially as a puppeteer, it's another world. You know, we're used to sort of um, most puppeteers are used to being supporting players not some maybe not necessarily by choice but it is what it is you know there's there's a there's not a lot of puppet work and and um so i kind of was i was content really to do that i i, I don't really i didn't have aspirations of necessarily taking anything over also because i had my own side work and i think that's something that's really important just having your own thing because um i love playing elmo it's 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 such a joy and 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 being with kids and, and and sharing experiences with fans is just so cool um but at the end of the day it's also really nice to have something you can call your own um certainly there are uh, you know there's a big responsibility with elmo um making sure that we're keeping the legacy going um, it's a, it's a tough thing but um there I, i'm also honored to do that you know it's it, to I sometimes pinch myself thinking that, you know, you're, 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 you're helping keep the show going. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful for that. At what point did you like, uh, I guess feel the most comfortable doing Elmo? Cause I've imagined it was, yeah. it was just like, like, again, like you said before, like, I can't believe I'm doing this, like all this pressure. Yeah. Cause how old were you at the, at the time that you started the 2013? What, how old? 
I don't know. I mean, I probably was 20. I'm 30 now. I'll okay. be 31. So whatever that was, I was in my 20s. Yeah. yeah. I, I, there was a moment because yeah. those first, first year or two were really rough because I was really just studying what came before study, study, yeah. study. And when you play a legacy character, that's something you really have to consider. There's so, there's a laundry list of things you're thinking about. On top of already, you kind of already have to be good at the performance acting side of it and the manipulation side of it. You know, you're going. I was going in to um, take over a character that had some of the strongest manipulation of the of these characters. So that was already sort of a lot to think about. So you're you're thinking about you know the previous performers manipulation style. You're thinking about their cadences, their, do they have a diphthong? You know, what are the regionalisms and how, how do they manifest themselves in the character? All of those things were constantly in my brain. And I would just, when I wasn't working, I would be watching tape over and over and over and over, video, not tape, over and over and over again. And just listening to, to, to Elmo over and over. And uh, there did come a time where I could sort of relax. I was very rigid in that first year or two and it shows i mean in the performance it's very stilted and it's by the books but there is an insecurity in it and i think which is natural for any performer you know you start doing a character and you don't you don't really have it yet and i i felt the first time i had it and i felt confident was a show that chrissy ferraro wrote who's one of our um writers at Sesame. she's always had such a great way she she writes elmo in such a wonderful uh, way because she can really access all of his emotions. You know, uh, Elmo's not always happy in her scripts. Mm -hmm. Elmo can really feel things. And um, she wrote this beautiful show about, um, it was a Halloween episode. And I think it was my second year as Elmo, maybe Halloween episode where he was dressed up as this astronaut and it was his favorite astronaut character um, from comic books. And he made all, he made the entire costume by himself. So it was great. It was like this, it was really funny. Actually, the, the shop built a water cooler helmet and it was a real water cooler. So I had the weight of a water cooler tank <laughs> over my head, uh, which is heavy, but it was really funny just sort of the way it sort of moved. And I, and, you know, he had aluminum foil on his, you know, a space suit and it was just all homemade and beautiful beautiful work um and he was elmo was real proud of it and and this uh, am character comes along and he has all the official stuff he's got the astronaut i don't remember what the guy's astronaut sam or something like that he's like i have the official astronaut sam helmet and the official astronaut sam laser guns and and elmo just sort of felt so deflated about that and he felt bad because his stuff looked he was embarrassed by it and 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 it was a real emotional show and and i always was excited about and still get excited about doing shows where elmo can feel that emotional range and like a kid you know kids are kids are really erratic in their emotional <laughs> they're happy one second they're angry the next and they're happy again then they're then they're sad and um and chrissy just wrote this beautiful show and for whatever reason it really clicked that day yeah. Um, I was very nervous about it because it was such a heavy show. It was very emotional. And, and Joey was directing, I remember, and he was so patient with me and supportive. And uh, that was the day that I felt like, I think I can do this. I'm not there yet, but I think I'm going to be able to do this. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people, um, you know, not necessarily in the puppeteer community, but people who, you know, see the show from, from a, a periphery, think of Elmo maybe as a one note character because mm -hmm. they know the doll they know oh you know tickle him and he laughs and whatever but he really is like one of the most layered characters and it, it must have been it it must have been a great opportunity to have that script for you to play so you could really get a sense of all the notes that are associated with him i i always look forward to things like that um i sort of when i started doing elmo kind of wrote a bio for myself I never really consulted with anybody, but I would write my feelings about what I thought he was. Um, and I, I came to the conclusion that there are kind, and I've now sort of adopted this theory that Elmo plays differently in different scenarios and different universes, right? So you have the, the series Elmo, who is a young, he is a young child and he, um, he has all of those things and he can, but he can also turn into a slightly older, snarkier character when he's on The Tonight Show or when he's in a live appearance, when he can sort of goof off with somebody. Um, certainly when you're doing a toy, that's a completely different, that's a different um, skill set almost. Um, because not only are you are you trying to make that as loving as a, as a 
feeling as you can get because you know there those dolls are really comfort items for kids and and there's a lot of trust in that and so you want to make sure you're really bringing across not this screaming high falsetto but a very genuine sincere loving quality while also maintaining your diction and stuff because it's on a voice chip and that's going to compress and crush and things like that so um you know i kind of play them different ways in different universes um but at the end of the day yeah I, I i you know i think it was something i was excited about too adding some layers to elmo um and i'm always pushing for that i'm always pushing for does elmo really love this can he not like it you know can he can he not like I don't know. Bro I'm just saying an innocuous thing, broccoli or whatever. Can that? Can we decide that that's something that is that because there's a story then? If he loves it, that's the end of the story. Um, so I'm always sort of pushing for that. And um, does Emil have to love everything? Right, and <laughs> you know, and that is something I genuinely question. If I look at a script and I say, okay, well, does he really love umbrellas? Right. <laughs> you know, can, can he be indifferent about umbrellas? Yeah. Um, Cause you know, I always, uh, I, my favorite moments with Elmo were when Kevin could really be himself in, in, in live appearances and, and, and uh, goofing in between, off in between takes. And is a much, it, it's a very rich character. If you, if you look at it, uh, you can choose to look at it as what a lot of people see, but I like to think he's, he's, he's pretty layered if you're, if you're willing to look for it. Now, I, I have a question. We were talking about um, the, 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 before we started uh, with you today, um, you know, Elmo, you know, really kind of came into popularity and there was the Elmo domination in, in the 90s, uh, which would have been if if you were, a, you know, a, a fan of, of the Muppets and Sesame Street, uh, you were maybe in the generation that was a, a Big Bird devotee um, or maybe um, what was what were your thoughts about Elmo when you were a, a kid? Were you, That's a good question. Was it a character that you liked or what? I never dis like? I didn't dislike him. Uh -huh. um, I never really understood the the backlash. Um, I thought he was an interesting character. I, I always gravitated more, to be perfectly honest with you, this yeah. is probably not the best thing to say, but I always gravitated more towards The Muppet Show. I mean, I uh, I love Sesame Street. and um, But for me, my favorite moments on Sesame Street, I loved the street itself, but I really liked the inserts because I, I loved the comedic... Um, I loved Frank and Jim playing off each other, and I loved Richard and Jerry playing off each other, and and I was I was big into sort of the duos. I, that was something that appealed to me as a kid, Kermit and Grover, and you know the guy Smiley stuff. That was really what I loved. Not to not to discredit anything else, I thought it was all great, but I was I was really a Muppet Show devotee as a child, and I that was something that I really gravitated towards, um, and it spent a lot of that was a lot of my focus as a kid. Um, but Elmo, I thought was fine. You know, I, I, um, I, it, I had sort of taken, I hadn't watched a whole lot of Sesame Street after the age of your, your don't watch Sesame Street anymore. Right. Uh -huh. And so I picked it back up when I got interested in puppetry again, because I also knew that was silly, but it just wasn't something that I was focused on. But as I started to pick up puppetry again, I guess I was about 12 or 11. So he was, he was a big part of the show at the time. But even then, I think I always liked Elmo more when he could be sort of slightly wry or, yeah. or sarcastic. I always liked him with Zoe. You know, I, I liked that he was slightly annoyed with some of Zoe's mannerisms and stuff like that and the richness of that. Oh, yeah. The um, whole Rocco thing was just like... Comedy. The Rocco thing was great. And, you know, we tried to do it once or twice after the fact, and it just didn't feel right. You know, it felt like that that was a thing of its time. And, and certainly that was Kevin and Fran and... And um, I kind of I don't know that I would want to do it now because it, you know it, it's it's one of those things you kind of want to keep with those performers, mm -hmm. but yeah certainly Rocco and and that kind of a thing I always I always thought Elmo was a fun character I always loved Elmo and Telly you know I loved Telly uh, still love Telly uh, and Rosita I thought they were just really strong characters so I was yeah. Very cool. So um, that you were such a, a big Muppet Show devotee, you must have really loved the opportunity. Um, was it last year or two years ago now uh, to do the the live Muppet shows at the Hall yeah? Hall. And did you do the O2 as well? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I guess that was two years ago. I can't remember if Hollywood Bowl was a year. It must be two years because we did we did the O2 this last summer. 
So yeah, and then the summer yeah. prior was oh, Hollywood Bowl, yeah, was right? Say, like, September, right? September seventeen, I think, was the Hollywood Bowl. Oh, I need to start asking you guys more about date. I am so bad with dates. <laughs> it's the, I I feel terrible. I have no memory of my own internal my my personal calendar. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that makes sense. So yeah, that was an amazing experience. Um, you know, I had done little stuff here and there for the Muppets. I had had the opportunity to do to, to do some things for them, and uh, that was certainly the it felt like the pinnacle for a lot of us, you know, certainly you ask a lot of Muppet performers, they're all going to, almost everyone's going to tell you really what I want to do is do the Muppet show. And so as we all kind of do, right. So um, it was very weird. I have to say it was, it was surreal um, to be in the arches in the, during the Muppet show theme and Dave goals is right there. And I, it was, you know, at the end with rainbow connection, I, it's a memory that will always live with me as such a sweet, tender thing that we'd be singing Rainbow Connection and I'd be here and Dave would be right here with Gonzo right next to me singing live that, you know, it was, that track was pre-recorded, but he'd be singing live just for himself, I think, because he was enjoying it so much. Singing, I, so I was hearing Gonzo singing Rainbow Connection and Magic Store in my left ear. And in my right ear, I have the track that I'm lip syncing to. It was a, It was an unbelievable experience. And also to have the opportunity to be able to do that ensemble thing. You know, when I was a kid, it was exactly what I was doing as a kid in my room, looking in my mirror, you know, puppeteering on the backstage and just, you know, you have these visions of wanting to do that. So the being a record track. Oh <laughs> God. Yeah. The tapes I recorded, I had all the shows. I wore every tape out. So uh, it was very surreal. And it was, I just, I was, I thought that show was so great. I thought it, and the audiences, you could feel that from the audience. You could feel um, it wasn't pure nostalgia. It was a, it was, a, it's something I think we really need right now. And I think it's important to have something that's sweet and innocent and funny and um, for everyone. And it was, it just felt, it didn't feel like, a, to me anyway, it didn't feel like a copy of the Muppet Show. It felt like, let's just, let's just do the Muppet Show. Let's pick it right back up. And, and I think it was a very happy show to do. Everybody was really happy. Um, same with the O2. Uh, it was a very similar show, but we had some different things. My track was relatively similar. I was, I got to do a couple more things in it, but, um, you know, it's just these great experiences. And, and, and it's funny too, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's all my family from Sesame street. So mm -hmm. there, you know, you, people tend to think there's like this delineation with Sesame and Muppets. There really isn't. It's all the same people, but, uh, in slightly different scenarios. So it was right. so great to be there with sort of my, my Sesame family um, doing these, these characters that I've, you know, been obsessed with for 30 years. It was, it was an honor and it felt, it, 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 it felt like all this sort of crazy insanity had paid off, you know, and, and you know, I've gotten to do a, a few things um, else with a few other things with the Muppets. And I'm just, you know, I, I love being there. I, I, you know, I love assisting too. I love assisting and doing background. Um, I don't get to do it very much anymore, but um, I do love it because it's that feeling of you can be in the car, but you're not driving the car. You're, you're kind of just in your, you're working for the bigger, you're working for the show. And I, and I love that. I, I love assisting for certain characters and um, that's something that once I became good at it, it took me a while. I wasn't very good at it at the beginning. And once I got better at it, I, I really found that I loved it. Um, especially once you get to know people's rhythms and stuff like that and, and filling in for characters, you know, I, that's something I love doing this. I love the study of, you know, if I have to put on Grover while Eric's doing Bert, how does Grover walk? You know, he doesn't walk, he walks and stops, you know, and, and just those kind of, I love that study. I've always been an analysis guy like that. So that kind of stuff's so much fun. Yeah. Well, and it probably gives you a sense of like, you know, if you maybe can't do the Grover voice, but you've always wanted to play Grover still, you kind of get to have that like, you know, make a wish moment of like, oh my gosh, I, I'm, I'm doing this for, for, you know, even if it's just for a scene or something. Yeah. And it's always, you know, it's always, it's such a supportive environment too. You know, it's, it's, it, you know, at that point, at that moment, you want to do the best for the performer who's playing that character. Right. Uh, you want to make sure that they're not looking at it and going, eh. You don't walk in that way, to, you know, and, and so, it, it, you know, again, it's very much servicing the show. And, and uh, you know, I, I just uh, it's that's a fun, fun thing to do. Yeah. 
Uh, now, when you you obviously have more have worked more with, with Sesame, um, but can you give a little insight? Is there do you feel a difference on like just the feel of the set when you're doing a Sesame production versus a Muppet production? I know it's a lot of the same people, but is there a, just kind of a different air in the studio or um, not really? I mean, yeah. I um, not from my perspective. Um, again, as I say, because these people, because I know these people so well, um, it's it's kind of, it's the same people in different outfits, right? It's like, you know, we're just putting on different, th different things, but it doesn't really, there's always a sense of play, you know? And I think that permeates um, through everything that we're doing. And I think it's really important too, you know, sometimes you're on a set of other puppet shows and it's very strict and rigid and you have to do what they're, you know, and there, there's no room for play. And I think, it's really important in the Muppet and the Sesame world to be afforded that opportunity to play and, and discover. And um, so, no, I've never really noticed that much of a difference. Um, it certainly it's sunnier cause it's LA. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't leave the studio uh, and it's, you know, raining or 12 inches of snow, but, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, the Elmo voice can't be an easy thing to, to do, to, to just create that, that sound and maintain it and maintain right. it. yeah do you have to do what, what's your sort of vocal regimen either to do warm-ups and cool downs or just to make sure that you're not damaging i am awful at that I, I none of us i have to tell you none of us do that and um we probably should but i think for me i'm lucky in the sense that i'm sort of a ten, i sit in sort of a tenor range right i i don't kevin was a baritone so it was harder for him to get up there I have, it's not as difficult for me because I already have a, I already have a, a, a younger voice. Right. Um, so, and it's funny because actually Paul Rudolph told me when I started doing Elmo that his range changed, that mm -hmm. he's, he can now sing in a slightly higher range just because that's where my voice sits. Um, and so the, it's not, it's only tough to do in vocal records, like I did, oh my God, I did, maybe this was my second or third year. They were testing out this new toy and um, long and short of it was, they needed me to record every, not every known name in the English language, oh, but God. pretty much something like that. It was, I think it was 40,000 names. It was either oh, 40 or 30. God. And uh, How it long was did that take. Well, it was <laughs> I think it was six or eight sessions of three hours and we were booking, you know, it was because yeah. you'd have to go, Emily, Emily, Emily. And you'd have to you have to do that for each one. Always when you're in a voiceover, when you're in a booth, you have to give three options for everything you do. You know, it's you have to give three options for everything you do. You have to give three options for everything you do. So you, you three options for everything you do. <laughs> and so for the toys, I had to do that as well. And it was oh, long man. days. Well, people I only... don't know. This is our third recording of this podcast. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. So by the third one, you're right. You know, you gotta, yeah. but uh, no. So I, uh, I did that and that was such a learning curve. It was rough though, man. It was, uh, but it taught me about the stamina of keeping that voice going. I save laughs till the end of a record and I don't do them unless I have to, because it's easier on set because when you're on set all day, you're not talking all day or you're not talking as Elmo. Like I never talk as Elmo if I don't have to, oh, because yeah. it is a strain, right? Um, eventually, but I, I do, I max out at three hours. My, vo my vocal sessions are three hours. After that, I will, I'll be on the phone with somebody and I'll be talking like the, my voice does crack after a certain a number of hours doing it. Um, but I'm able to do it the next day for the most part, unless we're, you know, there have been times where we're shooting things like Elmo's world or I mean, we're, we fly through those just because we have so much to do in a small amount of time. And I'll come in I, there. There has been one time where I came in and I, I woke up in the morning and I couldn't quite do it. And I was I was really nervous, but I was able I was I was able to squeak it out. Yeah. But it did. You know, what's interesting about a falsetto that I don't think a lot of people think about, especially with Elmo. And actually, like Mickey and Piggy and. All those voices, people people just tend to do this when they do Mickey Mouse or Elmo or whoever, and what oh they don't boy. right. But but what you're doing is is the right instinct, right? Oh boy, there's there's you've got two you have two uh, con, yeah. contract uh, con, uh, uh, contrasting sounds, right? So it's almost like a chord or like a like a subtone, like a clarinet. You have um, uh, it's not just the falsetto. 
also in that voice is that performer's lower register because that's just their natural speaking voice that's going to come out. So I'm always very cognizant of that. And when I started, I almost had to build up the scar tissue, for lack of a better word, to get oh, yeah. that resonance. You know, when you when I started doing Elmo, it was a very thin sound. It was also very hard for me to for diction purposes. The higher you the higher your falsetto is, the harder it is to speak clearly. Um, and that was something I struggled with for a while. Um, and still, there are some words he can't say very well. It's almost like uh, I don't remember what they are until I do them. But it's like <laughs> double L's are hard. They come out like R's, all or. Um, hallway or i don't know i'm just trying to but so there are some things he has a hard time saying or you're like what did he just say so um all of those things could together it's definitely I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking about it i'm always thinking about was that clear uh does it sound like him because sometimes it does get the longer the day goes on it does get gravelier and gravelier yeah but um the only people that really have to worry about that are myself and david david does cookie and he um i think he maxes out at about three hours that voice is rough man oh, i don't know yeah. how he does that i don't know how he does that and maintains it that is you're right it's the hardest thing to do is maintain a voice like that and you have to you know that's one of the biggest parts of the job can you keep that voice you know obviously we're talking about voice this is technique you, you guys know it's yeah. character but as far as a technical standpoint goes can yeah, you keep sound. Yeah. Can you keep that sound consistent for a six or eight or 12 hour day sometimes? Mm -hmm. well, I'm sure Eric probably has to deal with that. Like you said, with Piggy or uh, yeah. I, I know I, I talked with um, Martin Robinson at one point and he mentioned like there are days where like I get a really thick telly script. Not that that happens too often anymore, but he was like the same kind of thing of maxing out because that that gravel just. Starts and he his he can project uh, it's unbelievable what he can do with his voice yeah. uh you can hear him outside of the studio down the hallway you know he his voice projects so loud and clearly his he's got an incredible instrument um i don't remember the specifics of it but i remember paul rudolph recorded his voice to find out what the decibels were and it was some insane high number like he can really and yeah he he does i've i've been there on days where he's you know he's got a Okay, look at how many more do we gotta do? Yeah, because <laughs> he gives it his all, man. When he's got Telly on, oh, he's not holding back. Um, well, we'd love to talk a little bit more. I know we started the interview talking a little bit about the Idiot Club. Yeah, but we'd love to just hear, um, kind of, you know, when that started, and um, you know, just what what that creation process is like, because I'm sure it kind of feels like after working all day at Sesame that it's, it's your version of loosening your tie, kicking off your shoes and yeah. like having yeah. a good time. It is. It's, um, you know, Sesame street's great. I mean, it's, it's the best job ever. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, it is children's television and there is a big responsibility there, uh, that we all take very seriously. Um, so it can be hard sometimes, but there, yeah, there is a joy in sort of being able to have the freedom to do whatever you want. And, and certainly with my original characters, I I love doing my original characters because ostensibly you can never be wrong. You know, it's it's that thing when you're taking on a legacy character, you're hoping that you're bringing yourself into it enough so that it's not distracting from the original character. When you're doing your own stuff, if it's truly of you, you can't really get that wrong. And, and there's a freedom in that. Um, and so that's where it all stems anyway, really. I mean, Mark and I just, we do characters. That's, we're, we're, we're just character machines. And We've gotten to a point now where we've really had to pare our characters down because we, we can't have 12 characters. Come on, let's really <laughs> condense it. But that's, it, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. But we have always, I mean, so as long as we've known each other, if we're talking on the phone, we're talking on the phone like this to each other. We're talking on the phone, you know, we're just doing voices and we're, we're riffing and back and forth and writing. Um, and so we just said, well, we should just start doing this as a thing. We should. So it started out years ago, actually, when he was doing stuff. He was doing um, his own projects with this character, with a character he just called Frank the Horse, which is now in the Idiot Club. And um, he was working with Frankie Cordero on it a lot. And he was Frankie was sort of his sort of, you know, director and assistant puppet person and camera op and all those things. It was it was, you know, Mickey and Judy put on a show style, like set up a camera, let's go outside and shoot this. We got to shoot in five minutes for the cops going to come. Let's shoot it. <laughs> and, it, you know, and and um, and so he was doing that with Frankie. And then Frankie went off and did Walking with Dinosaurs and wasn't available to be there as much as he used to be. Um, and we were all friendly at that point anyway. So um, Mark and I started doing some videos and, and, and 
Frankie kind of joined us again when he finished walking with dinosaurs. And we, for a long time, we were really focusing on the Frank the horse character. And what we discovered was it was a much richer character if he was around our characters and if it was an ensemble. And so it's become this ensemble of characters we perform. And really it's been, uh, mostly it's been about the relationship of, of Mark and I. Um, Frank and Kip are very much, that is our relationship. And um, it's it's really fun to be able to play that out in weird scenarios. We did a we did a podcast really just for fun. We didn't do it with the hopes of anybody hearing it. And we didn't do it very long, but we did a podcast just to sort of test some things out. Uh, it was really an R&D project. And uh, we did some character bits on it and we just talked as ourselves. And that sort of culminated into let's develop these characters for some sort of a series. Yeah. And um, since then, we've kind of been a little bit, we've kind of been everywhere. We've, we've, we've done live streams. That's been another really fun challenge, which we're, we're looking into doing those again and, and sort of uh, um, upping the stakes of those and making them a little more high quality. Uh, that was a fun uh, experiment because we'd be up for 30 minutes with no breaks. That was the hope. That was the goal to stay up. Don't come down. And we did sometimes, but we'd make a bit out of it. But, you know, we would just be fielding questions from people asking the characters, you know, what do you like to eat? Or what was the last movie you saw? And we would be, it was just riffing. And it was, a, it was a big experiment. There was a, there, there, we both really enjoy sort of the looseness of that performance um, and not the rigid sticking to the script, the comedy beats, you know, it's, it's, it's a much more loose, um, surreal kind of a performance that we do with these characters. Um, and so, yeah, we've just been sort of doing little stuff here and there, developing the characters. We, uh, as I say, we've been uh, developing a, a bigger project that we're hoping people are going to, we're, we're, we're working it out right now, but we're, we're hoping that it's going to be able to be seen by a wider audience. Um, but it is really fun just to sort of let off steam and, and create your own characters. I, again, as I say, I think it's really important that people do their own work because, you know, and it's actually something that Jerry told both me and Mark at one point, like it, you should really do your own stuff. The Muppets will always be there. But I think if I hadn't had my own stuff, you know, cause it also involves, I learned how to be an editor. I learned how to direct. I learned how to produce. I don't like producing, but I had to learn how to do it. Uh, I learned how to do all of these things that I wouldn't be afforded those things if I was just working at somebody else's show. Right. Um, and it just makes you a better performer. It makes you a better puppeteer. It, it, it makes you a better puppeteer in the sense that if you're having to shoot your own stuff and edit your own stuff, you can think of those people when you're performing on another show. I can be cognizant of what the editor's going to have to go through. You know, I can think about, you know, when is it appropriate to give an, a thought to a director that they're having trouble shooting a puppet, you know, um, being in your light, all of those things. It just makes you a stronger performer. Um, and so for the longest time, for me, it was just an R and D thing and I couldn't help. I'm a maker. I, I, I can't help, but make my own stuff. Never with the intention of people seeing it just as it's just an outlet to, to get it all out. And, um, but yeah, lately Mark and I have been doing sort of, sort of more and more and, um, you know, it's, it's challenging right now. It's, it's, it's a hard sell the, the, um, puppets for everybody kind of thing. I think right now people are really wanting to see either puppets for children or dirty puppets. Yeah. So, you know, it's a longer road, um, but I think it's one that's worth taking the time on. Um, yeah. And it's been a really exciting, fun thing to do. Yeah, I think it's doing great work. What, uh, um, so when you did the like podcast and stuff, is that was that kind of like your writing process, would you say? And, and for yeah. a lot of your stuff, it sounds like this big project. I, I, I may definitely imagine you're doing a script, but are most of your other episodes like actually scripted or are they kind of like you have an idea and you guys kind of riff and film it? And then edit it's it? a lot yeah. of, yeah, well, a lot of it happens prior to, it depends on what we do. So for the podcast, that very much was all improvised. Uh, and for the live shows, that very much is the case. We may go in with like a sense of like, maybe Frank's maybe Frank's pissed because his in-laws are in today. So maybe we riff on that. But that'll be all we have, you know? Uh, for more, yes, for bigger projects, we definitely have a script. But that all starts with riffing. Um, Mark and I are not the type that can sit at a computer and type it out because for us that zaps the energy. So much of our performance has to do with the performance of the line. 
you know, and, and the subtlety of that performance uh, or, or the opposite of that. And so um, we are very much performing creatures. So we will riff and riff and riff. And then the hardest part of that is sort of um, concentrating that and to say, okay, which part of this is funny for everybody? Like, yes, we think this is funny, but which part of this is going to be a bigger, th it's going to be funny for everyone. And oh, so this part sometimes, <laughs> yes, it's very difficult, right? Because you have your own sense. Of, and then sometimes you have to just trust that I think this is funny. And if you don't yeah. think it's funny, so be it. But uh, yeah, so we don't really sit down with a typewriter <laughs> with a typewriter. <laughs> we don't really sit down with a we sit down with a typewriter and our monocle and we, we, you know, we don't sit down and say, okay, we're opening up the script writing program. Let's write it. Uh, because it just doesn't work for us. Yeah. Um, and so much of what we do is based in improvisation that it would be tough. It, I think the show would change. The characters would change a lot and become right. a bit more formulaic if that was the case. Yeah. That's so great to hear because one thing I feel like that holds a lot of people back is that writing process. Even if mm -hmm. they have the idea and some people, so many people I know like have a script. But yeah. You never feel like it's finished, you know? And uh, so, yeah, I think that's like a lot of great inspiration. For and I, I, Yeah. I mean, that's a very natural thing to think that the script's never finished because they kind of never are, you know, yeah. they're finished when you decide they're finished, but we've always had that. I mean, whenever we do something scripted, we think, boy, that just doesn't land the way we want it to. And it no, it won't. You don't now. know until you put it on its feet. That's, that's exactly right. And the script, oh, this is perfect. And then we film it like, oh no. That's exactly right. And, and that's where I sort of discovered writing in the editing room, you know, yeah. that you can really control your story in the edit. And that's something I really enjoy doing too. Um, I can't tell you how many in those early days, I can't tell you how many things we saved in editing just because we went, that's not funny. Okay, well, let's do this instead. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a night and then it becomes another, it, it's got another, it, it feels different too. There's a, um, it, we certainly don't write by the books. And I think, you know, it's, listen, it's hard. Puppeteers are used to doing everything on their own. And sometimes we have to give ourselves a break that we maybe shouldn't do everything on our own. Yeah. Um, it, I like collaborating with people. I like collaborating with the right people who get my sensibility and I understand theirs. And because the more people you bring into your circle, the richer your product becomes. Um, you know, certainly I am someone who likes to, I like to make the puppets. I like to shoot it. I like to edit it. But sometimes there's there's freedom in, in saying, okay, you go, what are your ideas for this character? And then we can riff about it. Um, you know, if I have a gun on my head, I can sit there and write something, but I, I, I don't prefer to do it that way. Um, and it's and also, I think the way that, the way that I think media is changing that it's changing that as well. You know, um, we're not necessarily writing 30 minute scripted comedies um, because nobody has the financial infrastructure for that online. Nobody has the, so what you end up doing is pretty short. We, we, what we end up doing anyway, are sort of short segments that don't really lend themselves to that format of writing. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it took a long time for me to be okay with that, to discover like, you don't have to be a writer. It's fine. You can do character work and that's fine. Um, I think a lot of puppeteers feel, feel they must be good writers and, maybe it's enough that they're really good puppeteers and finding someone that you can collaborate with can really help that process along. I think. Now uh, I know we've, we've, we've been talking about the idiot club as kind of a, a side project and stuff, but it, for people who don't know you, you guys ended up working with Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> at a certain yes. <laughs> yes, we did. So it's not, it's not a small, small little thing. How did that, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah. So we, I don't remember the um, beginnings of it, <laughs> but I had been, I knew Frank Santo Padre from, I want to say maybe from Stephanie DeBruzzo and Craig Shemin. They knew Frank. Mm. Was that how I met? I can't remember how I met him now. Anyway, I loved the show and, and, and I don't remember if he had seen what we were doing. But yeah, we, we shot um, a little thing for them. We built puppets for them. We actually just took some, I just took some blank puppets I had and redressed them. Um, and that was a really fun challenge. Um, I, I like doing portrait puppets because I like the challenge of it. And I like, I like really, sometimes when you're making a puppet, you're not thinking about, when, you have, when you're making a portrait puppet, the exaggeration, you, you really exaggerate it more because you're seeing what you're having to, if, if somebody's got a very pronounced 
eyebrow or something or, or wrinkles or, you know, may, that may not come to you if you're just building a puppet. You're not thinking like, oh, this, that person's got a big jaw. On. And so that was a fun challenge to make the, the caricature for Gilbert Gottfried. And that was a fun one. Um, yeah, I, I, we edited just a bunch of really funny things. I think we did a, we did like a, like a, Gilbert Gottfried is known for singing on that show. And so he, and I, I just think it's hilarious whenever he sings. And uh, so we did a compilation of that and that was really fun. Um, and so, yeah, we've had opportunities to do little things like that. And it's always great. You know, um, we've kind of moved away from it a little bit because for a while there, we were becoming the people who lip sync to other people's audio. Yeah. And that wasn't necessarily something we were interested in doing. Um, but that, that, that project was really fun. And I, I was really glad that that came out the way it did. It was, it was a fun one. We had the, I'm trying to remember who worked on that. I, Frankie worked on it and uh, some puppeteer friends of ours, uh, uh, Jonathan Carlucci. And uh, I think maybe Jenny Campbell worked on that. And it was a very small shoot. And it was, that was one of those where it was like, you know, I did all of it. And that it was towards the end of my days of doing that, where I think I remember thinking on that shoot, like, I'm really ready to not set up lights anymore. I'm really ready to hire someone to do this <laughs> because, it, you know, being a one man band after a while gets well, kind of awesome. tricky. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that was a fun project. Yeah. I remember watching that when it first came out and thinking like, oh, that's cute. They, they like built a Gilbert Godfrey puppet and they're using like sound clips from Aladdin or old stand up. And then it's like, holy cow. No, they actually <laughs> worked with him. Like, it was, yeah, it was so cool. It was it was it was a really fun one. Well, uh, you know, actually, there's, there's, oh, one, oh, one, yeah. there's one more thing. I just, it's just, I should have brought this up in toward the beginning, but it's just been ringing in my head the whole time. When you're talking about like when you first saw, saw puppetry, uh, you know, like, again, through the bars of, of your, uh, uh, when you were just like two years old, um, at what point though did you realize like this is something, these are people doing something, you know? Because it's, yeah. because like, I even think of myself growing up, like, I got into puppetry very late. Uh, you know, I, mm. I think I'm the same age. Uh, I, mean, I just turned 31. Mm. And um, like growing up, and I, I was just telling Cam earlier, I didn't even know who Fozzie Bear was until I was in college, to be to be honest. <laughs> but, but I watched We're gonna have to end this call. We're going to have to end Stop. this call. Because oh, growing up, I had only I, watched the I nearly Tre left the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> growing up, I watched uh, the Treasure Island one, and Fozzie okay. Bear wasn't Fozzie Bear. He was, You've seen know, the original movies now, though. Now I have. Yeah. Ken we, just gave me the DVDs them. last week. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Those are the ones to see. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, obviously I grew up watching Sesame Street. Sure. And they knew what a puppet was, but they just weren't puppets. Obviously, they were they were characters. And, you know, I saw these these characters on Sesame Street. And um, you know, in a store, a puppet is a toy. Yeah. You know? And even uh, until I was, you know, older, did I realize like, like, oh my wait a minute. Yeah. I, duh. This is people doing this. And obviously mm -hmm. you realized that very, very young. Like, well, how, how did you realize that? I think the first, well, I know the first time I saw it was the, there was an episode of the Jim Henson hour, which was a short lived show yeah. right before Jim died. There were, they did an episode that was sort of a making of here's how yeah, we do the Muppets. Secret of the Muppets. Yeah. Secret of the Muppets. That's it. The secret to the Muppets. And uh, it was, it was an, I, it was a jaw dropping moment for me. I was young. I just remember it was a shot with all the Muppets and he said, and now we're going to pull back the camera and you'll see all the people that do it. And the camera pulls back and there's a dozen puppeteers. And I remember seeing Jerry Nelson and Dave Goals and I, the connection of their voices and their performance coming out in Gonzo or whoever. And more than that, I was so excited to see the rigs, you know, the cable control rigs. I didn't know what they were at the time, but I, what is all that stuff? You know, what? Are, how are they moving the hands? And I'll never forget that. That was the moment where I said, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. Um, and I'm so grateful that that they were so willing to show that, that yeah. Jim was so willing to, to show yeah. people how it works. Um, Sesame very much has adopted that now. You know, for a long time, there was concern. Do we show performers? Do we not? And um, I'm so grateful that people are learning now that it's such an important part of what we do, not only for, um, for people to see that there are people behind it, but also for younger generations of performers. Because as you say, if we're doing our jobs right, 
kids aren't thinking of these as puppets. They're thinking of them as characters. And there is a beauty in that. But I don't think you spoil the magic by showing those things. In fact, I think it enhances it. Right. Um, and and uh, anytime um, I could, I, I just absorbed any behind the scenes stuff I could get. I remember the day I got Muppets and Men and it was like a breakthrough moment in my life. That, that book... I actually that book and the works. I actually the works. I read the cover off of it. I remember carrying the book around with the cover off because I had ripped it off. Uh, I had read it so much. Those books were such an influence on me. And um, once I found out people were paid to do it, I thought that's it. I didn't have a backup plan. You know, I again it was it was Disney or Muppets, but those were my only things. I had no backup plan. I didn't consider, you know, maybe you should go. And I did real jobs in between the rough, you know, the rough years, but. Yeah. That was that was what I knew I wanted to do. Awesome. Yeah, it's funny. I I had a similar thing where I had a, a PBS great uh, uh, PBS great performances. Documentary. Yeah, and uh, and that one it kind of shows like Jim and Frank, and you see like the pullback and all that stuff. Yes, which was so generous of them to do that. But um, no one actually mentioned it as a job. So somehow I just thought like, oh, okay, that's just like the thing that they do and it wasn't until i was probably like nine or ten where in another documentary i think with a and e uh there was like carol and steve and kevin all saying like oh yeah i was like 10 years old and then i you know realized i could make money on it and i was 10 years old at that mm -hmm. same time and it was like that glass shattering moment of oh my gosh that's that's a thing yeah um, it was very cool yeah yeah and yeah. And, and i i'm just so grateful that it, there are people still interested and you know, it's tough now. The it's it's as you guys know it. There's just not a lot of call for it. Um, I'm really hoping that changes soon because I know it's not for a lack of love of puppetry, right. um, and just from my interactions with that. One of the things again that the that the Elmo um, work affords me is hearing from the fans and hearing from casual people who are just are in, still in love with the idea of puppetry. Um, so I, I I have to believe that that. It, it, you know, everything ebbs and flows right now. It's a real dry period, but that I'm excited because there are still young puppeteers coming. We just had on the set a couple months ago, we had a, a, a 10 or 11 year old come in with his puppet and I was telling him, okay, here's how you make arm rods. And we gave him some Muppet rods and here's how you make eyes, cut some spoons and, you know, just being able to see that that's still happening. Right. Um, is is just so it's just really good to see that. You know, oh, that's so interesting too, though, because I do wonder, like, what is the future of puppeteer puppetry? Yeah, or, or the style of puppetry, because it is. I, I don't think it's going to be gone, but in one way, you know, the internet is bringing everything together. You can learn so much. Yes. Um, so it's more accessible to people than it ever has been before. But I still don't think that's going to make as much of an influx as it as it could, because there's it's not instant gratification. You know, and there are easier ways to get a more polished uh, a piece. You, you look at people's like Snapchat filters now where they're full character heads and stuff. If someone wants to do their own like little, you know, little bits of a show, they can immediately pick up their phone and have a show in 10 minutes. Yes. Fun, fun little character. Who needs a dog puppet when you could put it? Yeah. Not only that. No, <laughs> then they get their dog puppet and they're like. Oh, this is hard. So two things about that. It, this one doesn't work. Yeah. So I, I think that's a valid argument or a valid point. And I think my feeling about that is um, good characters will always be good. Yeah. Right. So I think what happens a lot with puppets is exactly what you're saying. Um, a lot of people want to do puppets, but they don't necessarily want to put in the time to learn how to do them, um, which is a which is a larger issue across all the arts right now. You know, it's really easy to get a royalty free stock music thing. So you don't have to learn how to play piano. Someone young doesn't necessarily have to do that. Um, so I think I think I agree with you that some I think the form will have to change in the yeah. sense that um, the way that we perceive puppetry, obviously, there's many different styles of puppetry, but the one that I've gravitated towards is the TV style, I think, because it's we're not really doing them for TV anymore. That will have to change. But I would always, I would say, um, if it's a good character, it's gonna stay. It's gonna stick around. And that's yeah. something I always try and reinforce in younger performers is it's not necessarily important to be the best puppeteer. And I mean this with no disrespect. Jerry Nelson was not the strongest technician, right? right. But he was the one of the, arguably the strongest performer 
as in terms of the range of performance that he could give, the range of characters he could do. So if he's dropping a syllable, no one's really looking at that. So I, that's something I always keep trying to instill in people. I think what's happened in puppetry, in this style of puppetry, is technique has is is overriding performance and manipulation and or excuse me performance and, and acting technique and character work um there's a lot of very good technicians because that's something you can learn quickly and at a very young age mm -hmm. and that's a great yeah. stepping stool but i do think if, in order for it to go on we're gonna we're gonna need to keep creating some more interesting new characters yeah well yeah but then just to push back on that a little bit because i i do fully agree with you but you know there are uh, you know there are animated characters as well you know I sure was just, I, I forgot what i was just listening to about the new mary poppins that they actually had to, like almost relearn how to do 2d animation because there was like no more professional 2d animators anymore in order to do that scene in the new mary poppins um oh god just so fast i look at uh, do you know nate beagle are you friends with him yep yeah i see i see a lot of his videos and he's Probably roll his eyes, just, but he does his Snapchat thing with his face. And it's like it just like I know he's obviously not trying to replace puppetry with what he's doing. I think they serve that. different functions. I think well, that, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. I guess it's like the gateway though, you know? Potentially. It's, it's so like, yeah. I, I think I think that um they're all valid. You know, it's I think one of the problems that puppetry is facing right now, which is why it's put in these boxes, is often when you see it, it's because of the novelty of it. Yeah. Right. When you when you look at Mary Poppins, it's beautiful animation, but it's technically it's the novelty of the animation you saw before. Right. So um, and, right. and right now with puppet work, often productions that are being created are within the, the, the construct of it's a puppet living in a person world and, and, and it and it's puppet jokes. So that's sort of a hurdle that that is tough to get over. Um, and it, and it's true that it is something the audience has to be able to, the audience has to be willing to buy into it. And I think I'm all for, I, you know, I think those filters are great because, uh, what I love about those filters is I've always wanted to do characters with lots of prosthetic work and yeah. being able to not have to worry about the, 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 oh, the budgetary yeah. restrictions of that. <laughs> I think there's there there's 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 a lot of potential in marrying those two things puppetry oh, with you know yeah. uh, you know I've I've been actively looking at some digital puppetry systems that aren't necessarily what we've already seen and I mm -hmm. think there's some opportunity for it but again I will never I will always love the the tangible right as we all will there's there's something about that maybe maybe there's some truth that you know that'll live more in a live scenario um, but it's very interesting to see how it's all going to go. I, at the end of the day, I do, I, I like to believe that it'll keep going because oh, it definitely as will. long as the work, as long as the work is excellent. Yeah. There's always um, going to be a place for it. Yeah. yeah there well, will always be a place like for it. like what you were talking about with the, the live Muppet shows of, yeah. you know, they maybe come for the nostalgia, but they stay because it's great puppetry, because it's new work, because it's. And because they're strong characters, yeah. because they know those characters and they know, what they're going to get and, and, and it's quality. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in seeing what the future of puppets looks like. Who knows what that's going to be. Sure. Um, but it's, it's yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I yeah. think for the next 10 years, it's going to be really interesting. <laughs> it will be very interesting. Big jump. All right. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a great place to, to end on. And, you know, certainly excited to see how you'll contribute to the next 10 years. But, um, <laughs> as we wrap up, we, uh, <laughs> we uh would love to kind of hear if you've got a good puppeteer story of oh yeah that, that uh, didn't go quite right but now we get to laugh about it a little bit <laughs> something that gave you puppet tears <laughs> yeah uh okay well almost i fell off once on tv oh my god <laughs> that was good um, the whole eye or a oh the whole eye so the whole eye the whole eye. So the way uh, Elmo's and Raleigh Cruson's head exploded. <laughs> almost. We. Yeah. Uh, I love Raleigh so much. She was so. She was so good that day. But yeah. it was a. It was a crazy day. Tough we, recovery. Yeah. It was a tough recovery. So we were doing a live show. It was me and Chris Knowings, uh, who is one of the. Oh God, he's one of the greatest guys in the world. He's just so kind, and we're practically the same person. Um, we he, he plays Chris on the, he plays Chris on, show, on Sesame yeah, Street. Excuse me, actors. Yeah, yeah, and he he and I when we get going, it's it's endless. So uh, we were doing some live show somewhere, and I'm deliberately forgetting which one it was. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I don't know what it was, but it was something for 
it was something on PBS, I think. And it was in the city. Um, and it was really early in the morning. It was a live show going on at like 730 or something like that. And we were outside and, um, I was using an Elmo that we use. We, so I use a couple of Elmos and there's two Elmos that are used all the time. There's the Primo Elmo, which is my preferred Elmo puppet. And then there's another Elmo who is just as good, but maybe we just think his face is not quite as good as the first one. So we use the first one a lot or whatever. It's minutia, little tiny things. So those yeah. two are always on set. And then there's a PR Elmo that go goes to do all the PR uh, things or live shows. If I'm going to do a touring show, to promote the, the the new season or something, we'll use PR Elmo. So uh, it had been a while since this PR Elmo had been refurbed. And uh, we were doing a live hit and I just did, I, 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 I don't remember what I did, but it wasn't anything out of the ordinary. I just sort of, I flipped the head around to look at somebody behind me. I mean, oh, it was in front of me. I did, I was looking back and I did this. <laughs> and in slow motion, I started to see a sphere, a white sphere, slowly making little circles, and I could, and the sun was hitting it. I was on the ground, and the sun was hitting this this eye, and I just saw it fall down. You know, in Christmas Story, where he drops all the the, the nuts in the <laughs> yeah. snow, that was the exact feeling I had, and it went right down. And all I heard was like a, and I I immediately we're still live. OK, we're still live and we had a host with us. And Chris, I, I love Chris so much, didn't say anything comforting of like, don't worry, he's OK. He went, Elmo, are you all right? Oh, no. <laughs> and it, it, it was hilarious. And I, and Elmo was just laughing and I was screaming, laughing. And it was and finally it was the sweetest thing. The camera operator for the show, he was doing a handheld. So he's ha he's got the camera on his shoulder with one uh, and he's holding it with one hand. With the other, he's picking up the eye and he's like handing it back to me. I'm what like, are you gonna do? What do you want me to do with that? But it was so kind. Like this guy just wanted to help. On and he just oh wanted to gosh. help. Oh. And in my delirium, this is I'm a crazy person. In my delirium, I put the eye in his palm. Oh my! <laughs> Don't ask me why, but at that point I was desperate. I thought maybe, maybe I could do a thing where he just puts it back on, and I did get it back on. I did get it back on, and I had to. I sort of just went, and it was on, but it was spinning because it's they're on post, so it was spinning. So one of his pupils was like a Marty Feldman, and it was going like this, and uh, that was, and then I had an appearance to do that night, so I, we were gonna have to take that puppet out to a live event that evening a gala or something so <laughs> phil toscano who was at the time one of the people who worked on our um a pr team an amazing wonderful kind person really hard worker went all the way out to the henson shop in queens oh. had to give raleigh and jason the bad news and they fixed it and then i think about a week later i went into the shop and raleigh went i'm gonna teach you how to put elmo's eyes back on in case this ever happens again <laughs> and uh luckily it, it's it actually happened once on set but it's very rare that it happens yeah. but that was a that was a real initiation moment oh, God. what oh, did the God. audience say or do or... luckily there was oh so i should say there was no live audience so it was oh, an outside okay. it was oh. outside on the street oh, oh, yeah. um and luckily i don't know that it was a show that a lot of ch kids were watching it was very early in the morning mm -hmm. so uh Luckily, not a lot of people saw it, but uh, it was a it was a, a very interesting moment in the life in my puppeteering life. <laughs> no one watches Good Morning America. Anymore. Yeah, right. It's exactly. It was the Today <laughs> Show. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, oh, that's hysterical. That's a oh that's God. a good one. Yeah, I yeah. know. Uh, that was like Elmo had some tears himself too. Though. That's right. Oh that's God. right. Elmo was fine. He didn't even feel it. Yeah. yeah that's right. Oh, that's good. I know. Oh. Yeah, I I heard a story once, and you could see the footage because it it happened on on Sesame Street. But there was a um, they were doing a song clip with I think um oh, I forget the. You talking about Patty Labelle? Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say the Patty Lapone, and I knew that was wrong. But when Bert's eye falls off, oh yeah, McNeil, well, you know, for the longest time, then... those <laughs> eyes were double stick taped on. They weren't stitched down for a long time, <laughs> and uh, then they it, it took a couple times before. And if you actually, if you look at those old shows, it happens a lot. Like they, yeah. there'll be a bunch of AMs running through, and like a nose will fly off. <laughs> Everything was double stick taped on, and you think about double stick tape, especially under hot lights oh, in the yeah. 70s those lights were hot man yeah. so just the adhesive just slowly 
they now they pin and they stitch everything down. Right, but right, uh, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, if you watch Muppet Family, sorry, I'm going total Muppet nerd on this. Yeah, but yeah. You you watch uh, Muppet Family Christmas and the scene where they're doing the Sesame pageant. You could see Prairie Dawn in the corner, and her eye is like literally. Like, oh yes, just running down her face. And, <laughs> and you yeah. think about a production like that, the last thing they're looking at is Prairie Dawn's eyeball because oh, yeah. they've got you know it's like those. And I've been in those situations, you know, because I always used to. I would look at those things and I go, "How do they not see that?" And I've been <laughs> in situations right. where we've got a massive group of puppets, and my head or somebody's head is in it, and then you watch it back, and you're like. How did nobody see that? No one told me. But that, you know, that was one of my favorite things as a kid watching the old shows. You know, if there was a big group of puppets and you saw someone's face uh -huh. or you saw like a hat or like, I just got so excited to see the mistakes because it, it just, you know. Yeah. Dave Goals is right there. How yeah, right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, awesome. So, uh, so how can people follow your work? The, yeah. You so um, we are, uh, the Dylan Gale Idiots are um, on Instagram and we are also on Facebook. Most of what we do is on Instagram these days, um, but we still have a pretty active Facebook page. Um, just Google the Idiot Club or Dylan Gill Idiots and we'll show up. We're on YouTube, which again, we really we're focusing more on Instagram right now, but you can see some of our older material there. And uh, I have a personal um, Instagram account, which is Ryan Dylan Muppeteer. You can see Dylan Gale stuff and um, anything I'm doing with Sesame and Muppets and uh, other sort of side projects you'll see there. Well, Ryan Dylan, thank you so much for coming on Puppet Tears. It was a pleasure to to talk with you and and to get to know you a little bit. And uh, yeah. hopefully, sometime in the future, we could have you back on again. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd be happy. Yeah, yeah. To. I want to. We want. I want to do an episode with uh, Mark Gale as well. And oh yes. Then, and then uh, later on, we got to do a together episode with both of you. Uh, uh, you better schedule about six hours for that one. <laughs> and. When you get Mark on, Mark's a great person to have on. He has a story about Jim Henson and orange juice that will blow your mind. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. right. We'll note that. <laughs> Ooh, yes. God, my mind is... Uh, hmm. Yep, yeah. you got to give him a yeah. call. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> All right, well, All right. thank you so much, Ryan. Cool, thanks, thanks guys. Bye. Thank you. Many thanks to the Puppeteers Patreon patrons who submitted some great questions that we got to ask Ryan Dillon in today's episode. If you enjoy the show, visit patreon.com slash puppeteerspod to pledge your support today, get early access to our guest list, and contribute your questions as we interview the world's most passionate puppeteers. Thanks for watching and listening each week.